Welcome, Madam Secretary, and uh, everybody joining us. The co committee hearing will come to order, and I want to begin by welcoming Ranking Member Hyde-Smith uh, and our colleagues um, on the Senate Appropriations uh, Subcommittee on Financial Services and General Government. Madam Secretary, welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, to testify on the fiscal year 2022 Department of Treasury uh, budget. Uh, and I also like to acknowledge now uh, some of the members of our second panel uh, for today's hearing who are joining us to discuss the Community Development Financial Institutions Program. Uh, they are Deputy Assistant Secretary Noel Poyo uh, from the Department of Treasury, uh, Mr. Joseph Haskins, uh, the Chairman of Harbor Bank in Baltimore, and Mr. Andy Anderson, President of the Bank of Aguila, in Aguilla, Mississippi. Uh, it was welcome news, Madam Secretary, to see that this year's budget request proposes an increase in funding for the CDFI program and not the elimination of the program that we saw in budgets from the previous administration. Since its inception, uh, the Department of Treasury has played a central role in maintaining a strong economy spurring economic growth and promoting opportunity in the United States. That mission has been essential to our nation's financial health as we work urgently to build back better and stronger from the economic damage of COVID-19. Under the leadership of Secretary Yellen, the Department of Treasury has been charged not only with providing historic relief in close co coordination with Congress, but also supporting a dynamic economy that harnesses the potential of each and every American. This work is far from simple and requires our full effort and attention, but thankfully the department has moved full steam ahead to help those hardest hit jumpstart our recovery and pave the way to a fairer economy. We are already seeing proof of that fact. Uh, in particular, I'd like to salute you, Madam Secretary, for helping to ensure a quick and efficient rollout of the expanded child tax credit benefits uh, that were secured in the American Rescue Plan. Under that plan, eligible families will now receive $3,600 for each child under six years old and $3,000 for each child between the ages of six and 17. And starting in mid-July, Families will start receiving their expanded child tax credit in monthly payments of up to $300 per child. It's estimated that this move will cut child poverty in half this year, and I hope we can work together to extend that credit beyond 2021 as proposed in President Biden's budget. Uh, Madam Secretary, I also want to commend you on the success in moving toward a global minimum tax rate for corporations to help stop the current race to the bottom that we're seeing between nations uh, as many seek the shelter of tax havens. Congratulations on reports of today's news of the G20, and we'll be following up with some questions on that front. Uh, it's really important uh, that our major multinational corporations pay their fair share of taxes, and your work has moved us closer to that point. The fiscal year 2022 budget proposes an appropriation for the Treasury Department of almost $15 billion, an increase of $1.4 billion over last fiscal year. There is no question that the Treasury has been asked to play a large role in addressing the pandemic and making sure that the United States economy recovers. And to achieve these goals, they've asked us for additional funding for departmental offices so everyone at the Treasury can do their job. There's no doubt that uh, we have asked uh, your department to do a lot more over the last year and a half. Within that total, you have requested $13.2 billion for the IRS, an increase uh, of $1.2 billion. Your budget also requests $80 billion over 10 years in additional funding for the IRS, split between mandatory funds and a discretionary cap adjustment for tax enforcement activities, which would be $417 million for fiscal year 2022. Uh, this committee heard from the IRS commissioner on many of these issues. He laid out a very solid case for providing these funds uh, to close the 
tax gap, uh, somewhere between $500 billion to $1 trillion in each taxes that are owed mostly by very wealthy individuals but not paid. And the in additional information can go to address badly needed services to provide all Americans uh, through uh, the IRS with respect to uh, the department uh, with, with the IRS functions. Um, before I end, Madam Secretary, I'd uh, just like to commend you and your staff on your responsiveness to uh, questions uh, and grateful for the assistance uh, your team has provided as we prepared for this hearing. And with that, um, let me end where I began by thanking all of you for coming today to share your perspectives. And now I want to turn it over to ranking member, uh, Senator Hyde-Smith, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I welcome you, Secretary Ellen, to our hearing today. And I look forward to your testimony this afternoon and the testimony of our second panel as well. I'm uh, very pleased to have a Mississippian with me today, a friend, Mr. Andy Anderson of the Bank of Anguilla in Mississippi, and Mr. Joseph Haskins from the Harbor Bank of Maryland, and uh, Mr. P Poya, a Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Treasury. Thanks for being part of this, and thank you for your willingness to serve in doing all you do. And we're here today to examine the Treasury's Department budget request for fiscal year 2022. Treasury's offices execute multifunctions, important functions, that promote economic growth and combat illicit finance, administer the Internal Revenue Code, and operate the federal government's collection systems and deposit system. Secretary Ellen, in addition to the traditional responsibilities, you really have a full plate. You've also um, are going to execute emergency response programs for a variety of industries and businesses. And since the beginning of the pandemic, the Treasury Department has been at the forefront of all of these relief programs. But um, unfortunately, under the Biden administration, we have seen government programs that were intended to be targeted and temporary during the pandemic become permanent. And we're also seeing some spending levels warranted only in times of crisis become common. As these health threats of the pandemic recede, the Biden administration continues to press ahead with even greater spending and higher taxes, which is a concern for me and uh, many Americans uh, concerning the budget. But uh, the first time in American history, a president submitted a budget to Congress that proposes annual deficits exceeding $1 trillion deficits in every single year of the next decade. In fiscal year 2019, the federal government spent $4.4 trillion, which is still a truly remarkable sum. Now the Biden administration proposes spending more than $6 trillion next year and in every fiscal year thereafter. As a result, the Biden budget would add $15 trillion to the national debt over the last 10 years. And uh, 10 years ago, I remember being really concerned about the debt levels and now in 2011, that just doesn't seem that long ago, that, uh, you know, just recently this, this has uh, been occurring. And I think about to time frames and timelines when Prince William married Kate Middleton that year in the so-called wedding of the century just wasn't that long ago. But in 2011, the U.S. debt stood at $14 trillion total in 2011. And in 2031, 10 years from now, the national debt will rise to $39 trillion under the Biden administration spending plan. Let me say that again, $39 trillion, from $14 trillion to $39 trillion in 10 years. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you, but these are certainly the concerns that I have uh, for the department and your funding request. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We've been joined by Senator Kennedy as well. Welcome. And uh, Madam Secretary, let me turn it over to you for your opening statement. Thank you. Chairman Van Hollen, Ranking Member Hyde-Smith, thank you for inviting me to join you today. I look forward to your questions. But first, I want to briefly discuss the state of our economy and the state of the Treasury Department, because I believe one depends on the other. When I took office back in January, the most urgent problem confronting our economy was obviously the pandemic, helping people make it to the other side of the crisis and ensuring they were met there by a robust 
recovery. Thanks to this Congress and its passage of the American Rescue Plan, I believe we're well on our way toward that goal. However, the ARP and its predecessor legislation are not self-executing. As you know, in order for relief dollars to effectively reach their intended targets, we have to stand up and manage new federal programs. Treasury has been tasked with much of this work, and we're proud to do it. But our challenge is that while our portfolio has grown to match the urgency of this moment, our annual budget has not grown in tandem, and the funding provided to administer new programs is temporary. Not accounting for inflation, our annual budget is still at the same enacted level as in 2010. And critical policy offices like <coughs> domestic finance, economic policy, and tax policy have seen their budgets cut by as much as 20 percent since 2016. The mismatch is very stark when you take a moment to scan the new bodies of work we've undertaken. Treasury has built a $350 billion program to help state, local, and tribal governments start operating normally again. The CERTS program will provide $2 billion to bus and ferry companies. There are two separate multi-billion dollar programs to help people pay their rent and mortgages. And of course, Treasury administers economic impact payments. The IRS entered the pandemic as an agency that processes tax filings and returns once a year and managed to marshal its forces to disperse more than 460 million payments totaling approximately $800 billion across three separate tranches. Now the IRS is preparing to make monthly payments of the expanded child tax credit to families of more than 88% of American children. Our team has done valiant work implementing these programs with the resources at our disposal. But we cannot continue to be good stewards of this recovery and tackle the new bodies of work that Congress assigns to us in the years ahead with the budget that was designed for 2010. Our administration has released its formal budget, and there are several critical areas where funding is needed. For instance, the Financial Crimes and Enforcement Network, FinCEN, is tasked with building a massive database that collects and secures beneficial ownership information. But Congress has not yet provided any funding to do it. Then there are the community development financial institutions. Congress has dramatically expanded funding for CDFIs with supplemental appropriations, and rightly so. These institutions are very effective at injecting capital into areas the financial sector hasn't traditionally served well. However, it's challenging for the CDFI fund to distribute greater resources and scale these programs without additional administrative funding. The IRS is in need of additional resources, too. Over the next two, 10 years, the American people could see rough, roughly $7 trillion fall through the cracks of our tax system. Why? Because many of the country's wealthiest taxpayers do not pay their full tax bill and the IRS is not nearly staffed up enough to ensure compliance. Today, the IRS has fewer auditors than at any time since World War II. Our proposal would give the IRS the funding it needs. For fiscal year 2022, it includes $13.2 billion from discretionary appropriations, plus $417 million for the first year of a program integrity allocation adjustment as part of the multi-year American Families Plan. Let me just say one final word about the IRS. Many of you have expressed concern about the recent ProPublica report. I am deeply troubled by it as well. And it's important to stress 
that an unauthorized disclosure of taxpayer information is a crime and that it has been referred to the FBI, federal prosecutors, and Treasury Department oversight authorities. We don't yet know what occurred, but all is being done to get to the bottom of this criminal activity, and we will be sure to update you as we learn more. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Secretary, and I'm pleased we've been joined by Senator Coons as well. And we will have uh, seven-minute uh, questioning uh, periods for committee uh, members. Um, Madam Secretary, one of the key planks, the central planks of the American Jobs Plan is to ensure that big multinational corporations uh, pay their fair share of taxes and that we stop giving companies perverse tax incentives to ship jobs and equipment uh, overseas. Uh, you've talked about ending the global race to the bottom, where countries cut corporate taxes uh, to keep up with each other, and that the only winners are those multinational corporations um, and their stockholders, uh, not the people uh, in the countries uh, in which they do business. I referenced uh, in my opening statement uh, today's report from Reuters um, about the G20 to endorse the deal on global minimum corporate tax. Could you uh, elaborate on why this is really important to American workers and American jobs and wages that we move forward with this proposal? Thank you for that question. Um, so we are hoping to gain endorsement uh, at the G20 for the core pieces um, of our international tax proposal. Most importantly, we are trying to get a very large number of countries through an OECD process. Um, almost 140 countries are participating in that. And we're trying to gain agreement that all countries will establish a minimum tax that their corporations must pay wherever they operate in the world. Uh, at the G7 in London week before last, uh, the G7 supported the idea that this global minimum tax should be set at least at 15 percent. And we um, are working toward uh, an agreement, a similar agreement at the G20. Now, I think this is really important because what's happened globally is that labor is a factor of production um, that is not mobile. Most people um, continue to live where they were born in their native countries. But capital is highly mobile, and it can move from one place to another in response to tax differentials and other, um, other discrepancies. And um, it is, that is that is triggered over decades now what we refer to as a race to the bottom. Uh, countries try to attract business to their shores by setting lower tax rates than their uh, neighbors. And uh, then our corporations feel um, if we have higher taxes that they're not competitive and we see them offshoring uh, activity, real activity and also profits activity and tax havens uh, particularly f benefit from that. And as countries try to outcompete one another in terms of cutting their corporate tax rates um, to attract business to their shores, we see a race to the bottom in corporate taxation. And this is really a global problem. And we think that the only way to solve this problem is to try to get an agreement among almost all countries and certainly among the G20 countries that we will stop doing this, that we will agree that um, tax, our tax rates will be set at a level and we're negotiating on what the rate is, but we're looking for agreement at at least 15%. I, you know, I think corporations um, 
contribute corporate tax revenue to the federal coffers amounting to only around 1% of GDP. Now, that's less than before the um, tax law was passed in 2017, and it's less than in most of our neighbors. And to raise revenue for the important um, programs that we truly need, um, investment in public infrastructure, investment in R&D, uh, investment in our people, to make our companies truly competitive, and to make um, our workers and uh, people who live and grow up in this economy able to compete, um, we need tax revenue to support those programs. So we're very hopeful that this initiative will um, en enable companies globally to compete on the things that should really matter, the quality of their ideas and the skills of their uh, people. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. And, of course, uh, the corporations here in the United States benefit from an educated uh, workforce, a well-trained workforce, uh, and that does require investments. Um, with my remaining time, uh, Reuters uh, published an analysis yesterday finding that U.S. corporations currently pay significantly less than their foreign competitors today and that this would remain the case even if the full Biden tax plan was enacted. Uh, in fact, they found that U.S. corporations currently pay an effective tax rate of 16 percent compared to 24 percent for their foreign competitors, and that if the Biden plan was enacted, those U.S. corporations would pay an effective rate that is five points higher, or um, about 21 percent. Uh, does that analysis uh, line up um, with your Treasury Department analysis, and what, was, what does that say with respect to some of the concerns that have been raised uh, about the Biden tax plan? So I've read the Reuters article. I haven't had a chance to review the analysis carefully, but it's in line with our own thinking. I can tell you that at this level of statutory rates as well, um, the United States um, uh, corporate rate, including federal and state, is below the G7 average, and if we were to raise it, um, in line with the president's proposals, it would remain um, in the middle of the pack. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Senator Hyde-Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, you've already referenced the article that was in ProPublica, a, a left-leaning media outlet that has published a series of articles that disclose some very confidential information in very significant detail, but these unauthorized disclosures occurred amid renewed calls of significantly increased taxes and expand the funding and responsibilities of the IRS, the same agency that pursued a vendetta against conservative groups during the Obama administration. And since you have referenced that, can you tell me what the department is doing to prevent further unauthorized disclosures? Um, well, there are very important safeguards, many of them in place to protect taxpayer privacy, and this is um, an extremely important priority and one that we at Treasury care deeply about. Um, part of the um, money that we're asking to be allocated to the IRS would better enable it um, to modernize its IT systems and put in place um, investments that would better enable it um, to protect against threats to the security of the tax system. So I do think we um, need to modernize the technology uh, that the IRS has. A striking statistic I can share with you is that the IRS faces 1.4 billion cyber attacks each year, and they're running their, uh, the tax system on technological infrastructure that dates back to the 1960s. So it is a priority for Treasury. It is a priority for the IRS. We will keep it 
absolutely top priority to protect private information, but we also need to beef up the resources of the IRS to enable it to enhance its defenses. And in addition to the private taxpayer data that was leaked, a separate Treasury employee was sentenced to prison earlier this month following her conviction for unlawfully disclosing suspicious activity reports and other sensitive information. And your budget calls for new reporting requirements to the IRS for inflows and outflows for businesses as well as personal accounts. How are Americans to trust the security of the Treasury Department data when private information is shared publicly again and again? Well, again, I agree that protection of private information is critically important, and we must take every step to ensure that it is protected. Um, the IRS obtains billions of reports every year um, on W-2 forms and 1099s and other information that is provided to the IRS to enable them to uh, check returns to make sure that income is being reported accurately. Um, I can tell you that studies by the IRS show that, for example, wage and salary income that is reported to them on W-2s is, um, is, is almost completely 98%, 99% reported faithfully on tax returns. Um, that $7 trillion over the next decade tax gap that um, I've cited uh, largely reflects um, individuals or corporations where sources of income are not reported on a regular basis to the IRS. And that's why adding to the information flow is really critical at um, trying to reduce the size of that gap. And the proposal that uh, the president has put forth uh, in, in the um, American um, family, uh, yeah, in the American Families Plan, um, it's really only calling for two additional pieces of information that would be added to um, the Form 1099 int on which um, financial institutions routinely provide the IRS with an annual report of interest paid on accounts. And the two pieces of information would be the aggregate inflows into the account during the year and the aggregate outflows. And those it's, would not be detailed transaction level information. This would be directly communicated along with other routine information uh, to the IRS, and it would help better help um, the IRS tax audit, audit crew um, target their resources in deciding where audits um, are in order. Okay. So, um, of course, every step would be taken to protect that information. Okay, and referring to the trillions of dollars, uh, Congress has appropriated nearly $6 trillion in emergency spending during this pandemic. And there are some calls in Congress for an additional $6 trillion in, quote, infrastructure spending that seems to include everything under the sun. And these amounts are in addition to the regular discretionary and mandatory spending levels each year but consumer prices rose by 5% last year, the largest increase since 2008. And according to a survey conducted by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, consumer expectations are that inflation will be 4% over the next year. These trends are vastly different than your budget's assumption of inflation reaching only 2%. And you have called these trends transi transitory and the result of the economy reopening after the pandemic. Do you still believe this? And what data points would you cause you to change your mind on these trends only being temporary? Well, I do continue to believe that. I think that for 2021, inflation will come out um, at a high rate, as you mentioned.
but remember that in the previous years, inflation was exceptionally low, and part of what's going on is that prices that fell dramatically um, when the pandemic hit the economy, airfares, hotel um, room rates, and the like, um, now that the economy is opening back up again, some of those prices are reverting toward more normal levels. So we do have a bunch of supply bottlenecks. Um, it's a bumpy path to reopening, but the economy is growing successfully and creating jobs. And I believe that after the year is over, inflation rates will go back to normal. Um, most, most measures of inflation expectations remain low and well-contained, and most professional forecasters and the signals we get from markets about inflation expectations that are um, we can we can read from inflation compensation in the treasury market suggests that beyond this brief period of say a year in which inflation is high that inflation expectations going further out are very stable in the neighborhood of 2% and that inflation will revert to those levels. Okay, I'll let thank, you, thank, to determine. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please were joined by the Chairman of the Full Committee and I recognize Senator Leahy. Thank you very much. And uh, Secretary Yellen, it's awfully good to see you and thank you for uh, being here. Uh, where is the saying about me, you live in interesting times. And you, you've done that both at the uh, Federal Reserve and, and now, but I'm delighted you're there. And I know that the um, Treasury Department over the past year had to undertake all kinds of initiatives to administer the funding as directed by Congress through the CARES Act, the Historic American Recovery Act, and so on, um, but let me let me go into that a little bit. The American Recovery Plan provided three hundred and fifty billion dollars to support state, local, tribal, and territorial government to deal with the consequences of COVID. Um, the money it was specifically allocated money to states and territories separately to counties, cities, and towns. Now, some of the states, of course, do not have a county government, like my own state of Vermont. And in those cases, the law states pretty clearly the money be provided directly to the states, then passed from the state onto local municipalities based on population. Most of the country that's happening, but the Treasury Department is somehow i chosen to rely on a definition from the Census Bureau to define what constitutes a county government as a definition that was not specified in the law. I remember when the law was written, it was not, was not specified there. and gives a totally strange conclusion in our state. Counties in Vermont are not general units of government. We have 14 counties. The only county officials in Vermont are part-time side judges. I think they get paid a certain amount per day when they show up. Um, they run our county courts, but even that's a, at a minimal thing to make sure the lights get turned on, the doors get open. No other services. All our health, education, and government services are provided by local municipalities, but under the Treasury's arbitrary decision to apply the Census Bureau's definition, these side judges who might, throughout the whole state, normally handle a few thousand dollars, now they're going to be required to administer over $121 million of COVID relief dollars. Uh, they're, they're kind of like what do we do with this? Uh, or just say, you know, we have no way of administering this, we'll give it back to the Treasury. Well, that's not what the law intended. It was supposed to go 
to the states and municipalities. Now, your department's been speaking with my staff and with the others in the Vermont delegation, <clears throat> but I just want to know when the Treasury Department Minister of the Law, as we specifically wrote it, they intended it, and just release the money to the state of Vermont. So, Senator, I, I certainly understand your concern. And, um, you know, our staff has done its best um, to administer the funds in line with its understanding of the law. Um, the country is complicated. Counties in different states have different kinds of governmental responsibilities, and they try to make those distinctions. But we, we want to work with you to find a path forward and to resolve the concerns that you have. And I, um, you know, you've pointed out that there are distinguishing factors with respect to how Vermont counties operate relative to uh, counties in many other states across the country. Um, you know, if you'll work, have your office work with our staff, well, we will we're, try we're, to we're find out. We're doing a, that now, but the, the uh, I thought the law was pretty well clearly written. If you don't have a county government as such, I mean, if you got the county government where two people arranged to have the, the snow plowed around the courthouse and they suddenly got ten, fifteen million dollars and they're like even our best year we don't get that much snow. And uh I I I think it's written in such a way, the law I read it as I read it, is written the money go to the states and the states can then distribute them to the municipalities, and we do have municipalities, of course, that do have everything from police forces to uh, uh, normal town city government, and they could use the money. So we've been working with your staff, but please tell them to go back and read, read the law. I think it's pretty clear in the face. I, I think part of the issue was do the counties have governmental responsibilities. And it sounds like in Vermont, they have some, but they're exceptionally limited. It's like turn the lights on the courthouse. So if, if they have, a, if it's a county with a county court. So my staff understand that this is a significant concern and we'll work closely with you to try to find a resolution. Well, and I would also point out another thing uh, in rural states, the IRS is the only element of the, one of the only elements of the federal government that taxpayers interact with annually. Now, if you don't have internet service or they rely on phone or in person, it's a problem because the IRS is nearly impossible to reach by phone or in person. Uh, and of course, they're getting less and less centers and I live six miles outside of our state capital. I pay a premium amount for uh, my internet service, and, and there have been days that it's worked. I, we usually mark it down the calendar as a very special <laughs> days. We celebrate those. Uh, and I think I pay for it for a year. I, I, I can count on at least a week or two out of that year. But But the point is, I mean, I don't have to worry. I go to my office in Montpelier or Burlington and if I, or home down here, and if I got things I got to go back and forth, I can do it. But in many rural areas, in states that we all represent, that's not the case. So um, take a look at this because it, I mean, we can joke about it, but it is a real problem in rural America. And the, f the funds can be used for broadband, and the uh, rescue plan contained other funds and programs also that can be used for broadband. But again, I'm delighted to see you here, and I offer you congratulations or condolences, whichever <laughs> the day might be. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Senator Lee.
Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, thank you for being here. Um, according to the Department of Labor, I believe inflation was uh, annualized was 5 percent in May. I know you're not clairvoyant, but you're experienced. Where do you think inflation will be at the end of this year? Well, let me go to 2022. No, I'm, if you could go to the end of 2021 first for me. So I, I believe that my, my expectation, although there's a lot of uncertainty, is that the monthly data, the data that would pertain to what happened in a given month, that those numbers will come down. But Back, by the end of this year, I, I, do you expect the inflation to be more than 5 percent or less? I believe that the monthly numbers are likely to generate annual inflation rates. If you take the monthly number and ask what would inflation be if it continued at that pace for a year, I believe that will come down to a 2 percent. But typically inflation Madam rates... Secretary, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but my question was pretty simple. Right now in May, on an annualized basis, we both know what that means. Inflation was 5 percent. I know you're not clairvoyant, We're, but the, where do you think it will be at the end of this year? So most – the type of inflation number that you're talking about compares the level of prices this month with what they were a year prior. That's correct. And that's different than what happened over the span of the month. I understand that, but I'm asking by, you – By the end – I'm asking you – Inflation Based on a year ago, this is not a complicated question. I'm not trying to be rude, but, but this is not a complicated question. We're at 5 percent now based on where it was a year ago. So now we, we know what we're both talking about. For the rest of will this. Will it be higher at the end of this year or will it be less? Twelve months, I believe it will come down. You think it will be less by the end of this year? Than 5 percent, yes. Okay. What makes you think that? Because I believe that as the economy is opening up again, um, prices that fell enormously at the beginning of the pandemic are returning now back toward normal levels. And so what we're seeing in these year-over-year year comparisons is of prices which are now reasonably normal or in many cases at levels that are still somewhat below normal, we're comparing those levels with highly depressed prices the year before. I understand. And that but, will but I've just got a limited amount of time, Madam Secretary. Um, if, what you, if you think in 5 percent inflation in May and you think it will be less at the end of the year, yes. then why did the Federal Reserve announce that it was going to uh, – um, thought they were going to have to move their interest rate increases sooner and faster than what they had originally expected. Well, I don't really want to comment on the Fed, but I would simply say that is not an announcement that they made. Well, the market sure reacted. Sounds like the uh, Federal Reserve's worried about inflation. Um, I. I would just refer you to the comments that Chair Powell made in testifying yesterday and at his press conference. Well, but I'm talking about the action that the Federal Reserve took. The Federal Reserve met recently and they said, look, we know we told you this, but things have changed. They, and we're now telling you that we're likely to have to raise rates sooner they, I'm, and I'm faster. Let me just finish. Than we originally uh, told you. Why do you think they did that? That, that because is, they're concerned about inflation, aren't they? That is not what they did. Several, individ sure several individuals wrote down in their own individual forecasts, which were published, that they saw uh, it appropriate to raise rates sooner than previously. Why, why then did the Federal Reserve last week 
raise the interest uh, rate on excess reserves. That's a technical adjustment that they made because um, the federal funds rate had fallen uh, to the very bottom of their target range, and it was a purely technical adjustment. Look, I, it's not appropriate for me to discuss Fed policy. Well, sir, I don't no want to comment it on. Is. It is. I'm not asking you to make Fed policy. I'm asking your opinion. And, and usually when the Federal Reserve raises interest rates on excess reserves, they're trying to contract the money supply. No, the it's reason a, they're trying to contract the money supply is because they're worried about inflation. It's a purely technical adjustment. They made clear in the, the stance of monetary policy has not changed at all, but because short-term overnight rates were drifting to the very bottom of their target range, they made small adjustments. Okay. Let me, policy let me stop you rates. I've only got a minute left. Here's my worry, Madam Secretary, and I hate to have to interrupt you, but we, we only have so much time. Um, I, I know your job is to put the best face on it. And I understand the Federal Reserve's job is to put the best face on it. But inflation at 5% annualized gets my attention. Uh, when the Federal Reserve says, or even certain members, they say, nothing to worry about here, nothing to see, but by the way, we're probably going to have to raise interest rates sooner and faster than we thought. And when I see them raise the interest rate on excess reserves to so get money out of the money supply, that tells me they're worried about inflation. And here's my question. Nobody's clairvoyant. A lot of these experts that you talked about never called the recession in 08, 09. A lot of these experts at the, reserve, at the Federal Reserve, what if they're wrong? And the president has been adamant that he's not going to raise taxes on middle-class Americans. He's allowing that to happen right now because inflation prices are rising higher than, than wages. And 5% inflation is a tax. It's a tax on food. It's a tax on energy. It's a tax on everything. And we can say it's temporary, but the actions of the Fed indicate to me they don't think it's temporary. Your thoughts. Madam, Madam Secretary, I'm going to have to leave it at that, Senator. We'll have another round. Um, but uh, Well, others went over, Mr. Chairman. What's that? Mr. Others went over. I, actually, they went over about the same time. Um, but uh, let me well, call on. Can I get an answer? Uh, and the next, we'll have another round because I, I, I'm just trying to keep everything, <laughs> um, you know, with, within the fair range here. Uh, I understand that Senator Coons, who's been very patient, um, has uh, been understanding to let Senator Moran uh, have a short statement, and then we'll go to Senator Coons. Uh, Senator uh, Chairman, thank you, and Senator Coons, thank you for allowing me 30 seconds. I hope that's not a terrible burden uh, on your schedule. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, you and I uh, visited. Uh, I questioned you in the Banking Committee in uh, March. Uh, and I just wanted to be here today. I have two other uh, hearings that are ongoing at the same time, but I wanted to be here to thank you for making clear in Treasury's updated uh, frequently asked questions. It was just released today that the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds may be used, may be used for grants to small businesses, to nonprofits, to cover utility costs. Uh, this will alleviate a lot of consternation across Kansas and Midwestern states impacted by a February cold snap and elevated natural gas prices in the midst of dealing with the economic impacts of the pandemic. So thank you for making that clear, uh, and I assume that I'm telling the story as it is, is true. I believe so. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Senator. Senator Coons. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Van Hollen, uh, Ranking Member Hyde-Smith. Um, uh, Senator Moran is going back to serve as the ranking on the CJS approach subcommittee hearing that I, too, am supposed to go back to. Uh, I am very much looking forward to the second panel. Appreciate uh, Secretary uh, Yellen's uh, testimony and leadership, and um, Chairman Van Hollen, good to see you leading this subcommittee um, so ably, um, and to see the 
a team that supports and makes possible the work of FSGG. Uh, Madam Secretary, if I might, uh, you and five other former Treasury Secretaries um, have noted um, year after year, Congress after Congress, that the IRS lacks the resources to effectively and fully enforce tax payment. In fact, you made the somewhat striking and memorable assertion that the IRS at this point has the fewest auditors since the Second World War. And the tax gap is estimated as uh, somewhere between $600 billion and a trillion a year, um, and it is something that is the uh, topic of um, active negotiation right now in terms of how to pay for a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, how would the IRS ensure that new auditors, new enforcement efforts um, are focused on high net worth individuals, um, individuals with complex financial situations and international and multinational corporations, which are more difficult to audit as opposed to lower income people whose returns are more simple to audit? Well, the purpose of the um, mandatory funding that um, the president has requested for the IRS, um, he's requested $80 billion over a decade, is really supposed to be a long-run um, program allotment that would enable IRS to hire, train, um, auditors who have the skills and the long-term perspective to be able to focus on high net worth individuals, high income individuals, and partnerships and complex um, arrangements and corporations. That's where the tax gap is. Right. And the, pur the purpose of that funding would be uh, to improve uh, compliance in those groups where um, Underreporting is highest. And what's your rough estimate at this point of the multiplier um, for dollars spent on additional enforcement, dollars received in terms of additional compliance? Um, I believe I believe we estimate that the eighty billion dollar appropriation would generate around two hundred and forty billion over ten years. Um, the the long run payoff is. I think it's estimated by the IRS to be close to five to one. And I want to emphasize, you know, it takes a long time right. both to build up the resources Understood. and these complex cases take many years. And so there are enormous gains beyond the 10-year horizon as well that you would see in the budget. So I believe the IRS estimates are something like five to one in terms of um, income collected to a, per dollar spent. Madam Secretary, for the years that I served on FSGG, um, I've also paid close attention to the most frequent complaints from Delawareans um, who often uh, reach out to my constituent services folks to say that they're having difficulty getting someone on the phone, um, getting their tax returns and refunds processed more recently, getting the economic impact payments. Um, I'm assuming that an increased budget for IRS taxpayer services will directly benefit and impact that, um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But first, I'm going to go to a more complex subject for a minute, um, since we may have a return of another member who wants to question. Um, I, I am very interested in um, how you see um, carbon border adjustments um, working out, um, both competitively for the United States and in terms of its impact. Um, I'm someone who's introduced a number of bills, uh, one bipartisan, more recently ones that are just Democrats, that would place a price on carbon, and I'm convinced that that has the single greatest leverage in terms of achieving progress on climate change. I'm the co-chair of the Bipartisan uh, Climate Solutions Caucus, and we've debated and discussed this with many leaders uh, from the private sector, from financial services, different advocates and organizations. Um, and I think that there is a moment here where, as discussed at the G7, um, the EU is on the verge of implementing a border carbon adjustment, um, and there is the possibility that the United States, without imposing a fee on carbon, could simply deem um, the social cost of carbon and of other greenhouse gases at a certain amount and begin to implement that in order to avoid other countries imposing a carbon tariff against our exports uh, and making us less competitive. How do you see that playing forward? Um, what do you think are the models for the actual cost of greenhouse gases sufficiently detailed for us to be able to implement something like this? 
And how is the administration thinking about border carbon adjustments in ways that would keep American industries and services competitive globally? So I think we're just beginning to get a handle on this question. There's a lot of work to do to think this through. I mean, as you know, the president has proposed an ambitious and comprehensive agenda um, to try to reduce U.S. Um, greenhouse gas emissions and has made um, our nationally determined contribution right. is an ambitious one. And, um, you know, he's proposed to do that um, through a whole variety of different carrots and sticks. Um, remove um, existing subsidies for fossil fuels, tax credits for renewables and for electric vehicles. Um, he, he hasn't taken the approach that some countries have of simply having one system with a single carbon price. Right. But I think that if we do make the progress that we hope for, that um, the um, areas that are covered will be covered, say, by EU uh, carbon border adjustment, that we will also be um, producing those goods um, in a manner that is environmentally friendly. And if we are able to do that, my own view would be that we should not be subject to, um, say, the EU's carbon adjust right. adjustment price. So if I hear you right, to summarize, in a larger sense, um, if the Biden um, administration's plan and agenda is fully implemented, we ought to be able to go to our Canadian neighbors, to our EU trading partners, and say we shouldn't be subject to this border adjustment tax uh, because we are making robust progress towards our national um, goals. Um, let me just close, and I'd love to hear more from you about this. I was Certainly. talking to Jay Powell about this yesterday and the research that's being done within the Federal Reserve System um, because there's a lot of research to be done for this to be better understood. Um, I, I just want to thank you for what I think is a, an appropriately robust uh, request for funding for the GEF and the Green Climate Fund, um, a modest but necessary um, request for $15 million to continue to implement the Tropical Forest and Coral Reef Conservation Act. I'm working with Senator Portman on reauthorizing it. Um, and I'll just simply note for the record that my constituents are pleased when the wait times go down and just desperately annoyed and angry when the wait times go up. And improving IRS service standards is something that I would hope all of us could agree is well worth investing in. Com completely agree. I mean, that that's, um, will be an inf important use of funds is to greatly improve taxpayer service. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you, uh, Senator Coons. Um, Madam Secretary, we're going to do another five-minute round of questions. Okay. Um, I don't know if what other members of the committee will or will not be returning, but I, I do want to quickly turn to the debt ceiling uh, because, as you well know, uh, the debt ceiling is currently suspended until July 31st, um, just end of next month. Uh, after that point, uh, the Treasury Department can prevent a default for a brief period of time with its so-called extraordinary measures, but Congress... Uh, must ultimately raise the debt ceiling to prevent a default of the full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, there are murmurings that some members of the Senate uh, may want to try to use this as a political cudgel uh, to extract concessions on other things. Could you speak briefly to the consequences of a default on our national debt or even creating uncertainty uh, around whether or not we're going to make good on our full faith and credit? I, I think defaulting on the national debt should be regarded as unthinkable. Failing to increase the debt limit would have absolutely catastrophic economic consequences. Um, it, it would be utterly unprecedented in American history for the United States government to default on its legal obligations. Um, I believe it would precipitate a financial crisis. It would threaten the jobs and savings of Americans um, and at a time when we're still uh, recovering from the COVID pandemic. I would plead with Congress simply to protect the full faith and credit of the United States 
by acting to raise or suspend the debt limit as soon as possible. Preferably, you mentioned July 31st is the date that the um, debt limit suspension ends, and I would really urge that the, um, the debt limit be raised or suspended again before that. And, you know, this is not about authorizing additional spending. This is simply about the government paying its bills, um, making good on the payments that are implied by the um, tax and spending decisions that Congress has made. I appreciate your underscoring that very important point. This is about paying the bills that are already due and owing. Do you have an estimate as to how long use of the emergency measures would, would last us uh, in this current e economic environment? Well, we're constantly trying to refine our notions on that. I don't have anything specific, but, you know, these are times, especially because of the pandemic and the programs that we're engaging in, when there is a lot of uncertainty around payment flows and the timing of payment flows. And, um, you know, we don't want to just look at what is the most likely time that um, we could make it to with extraordinary measures. We can't tolerate any chance of defaulting on the government debt, and there is a lot of uncertainty. It's possible that we could reach that point um, while Congress is um, out in out in August, and I would really urge prompt action on raising raising the limit or suspending it. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. I just want to put two uh, issues on your radar screen. I don't expect an answer today, but uh, so Senator Toomey and I, um, in the last Congress, authored uh, the Hong Kong Accountability Act. It was passed into law. I was pleased to see the Biden administration sanction a number of uh, officials who have been complicit in undermining democracy and human rights in Hong Kong. Uh, but that law also requires sanctions against any financial institutions that are aiding, abetting, or facilitating those individuals. And Treasury has not uh, imposed sanctions on those financial institutions. Um, maybe you haven't been able to identify any such institutions. You have not. Yet, um, I, I think Secretary Toomey and I are in the process of asking for a briefing um, with respect to Treasury's um, capacity uh, to monitor these things. The other thing I wanted to mention is the Brink Act. This is also uh, legislation that Senator Toomey and I and others uh, pushed for that applies secondary, secondary sanctions on uh, North Korea. Yes. And, and here there's a discrepancy because the UN a panel of experts just earlier this year you know, found that there were huge holes uh, in the sanctions okay. regime, that there were uh, Chinese entities uh, that were essentially facilitating, you know, payments to North Korea that would be subject to secondary sanctions. And so uh, we do want to follow up with you on that as well. We would be, we would be glad to discuss that and follow up. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I don't know if... Uh... Great. Madam Secretary, um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for requesting uh, this increase in funds for CDFIs, uh, which play an essential role. And now we're going to get some firsthand accounts um, of uh, how important they are. Thank you. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to bring up uh, our distinguished uh, next panel.
All right. Uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Um, we have three terrific witnesses uh, for our next uh, panel. Uh, Mr. Noel uh, Andreas Poyo, uh, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary at Treasury uh, for Community and Economic uh, Development and is a real expert uh, in this area of CDFIs. Uh, and I've had the privilege of talking to him previously and grateful for your being here. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Joseph Haskins, Jr. He's the Chairman and CEO of the Harbor Bank of Maryland, which is in Baltimore. And on a personal note, uh, somebody who I really rely on uh, for advice on how we can make sure uh, that our most distressed businesses and businesses that are sometimes left out of the financial system uh, get the support and help they need, which was important, of course, during the pandemic, but also important to make sure we build an economy and a community uh, that ensures that everybody uh, has a chance to succeed. So I'm, I'm really grateful that he's here, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ranking Member Hyde-Smith to introduce our third panelist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I am really pleased to have with us Andy Anderson of Anguilla, Mississippi, and that's kind of hard to pronounce, and we're a long way from Anguilla, Mississippi right now, but I so appreciate each of you coming and be willing to give of your time because it is really important that we hear from you and uh, what you go through. And Andy Anderson is the uh, chairs, the board of directors and executive committee of the Mississippi Bankers Association. He's the chairman this year. He has 37 years experience in the banking business and all at the Bank of Anguilla. So uh, if you ever visit Mississippi, be sure to come by and uh, visit with him. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Poyo, why don't we start with you as the administration witness, and then we'll turn to our other two witnesses. Very good. Thank you, um, Chairman Van Hollen, Ranking Member Hyde-Smith. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to speak with you today. My name is Noel Andres Poyo. I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Community Economic Development at the Treasury Department, um, and I am also a, a former CEO of a CDFI. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony on Treasury's fiscal year 2022 budget and specifically about community development financial institutions and Treasury's CDFI fund. So CDFIs, as you uh, both know, are specialized financial institutions, including loan funds, credit unions, community banks, uh, venture capital entities uh, that have a common goal of filling financing gaps in underserved and low-income areas uh, with responsible financial products and services. CDFIs uh, are accountable to the communities they serve and possess a particular sensitivity uh, to the needs of local residents and businesses. This is a key reason that CDFIs often deliver capital in places where traditional banks have not met the market demand. CDFIs provide not only financing, but also development services to help prepare borrowers for success. Since the creation of the CDFI Fund more than 25 years ago, CDFIs have played an increasingly important role in opening access to capital and economic opportunity in low-income communities and, 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 uh, and for low-income people. And so keep in mind that at the end of 1997, there were 196 certified CDFIs with total assets of $4 billion. Now, there are more than 1,200 certified CDFIs operating in every state and with assets of over $220 billion. The collective capacity of this field to deliver fair and responsible financing is growing rapidly. And uh, before this year, the CDFI Fund had awarded nearly $4 billion to CDFIs and other community development entities. Uh, CDFI Fund has also allocated $61 billion in tax credits to the New Markets Tax Credit Program and guaranteed $1.6 billion uh, in bonds to the CDFI Bond Guarantee Program. And as you well know, the CDFI Fund's investments are leveraged many times over. So the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021 made available historic funding for CDFIs under three programs being implemented by Treasury. $1.25 billion in grants to CDFIs under the Rapid Response Program uh, through the CDFI Fund, $1.75 billion uh, to, in grants to CDFIs under the Minority Lending Program, and then $9 billion for Treasury investments under the Emergency Capital Investment Program, which is available to credit unions and banking entities that are either CDFIs or minority depository institutions. 
Um, you uh, may have heard on June 15th, the Vice President and Secretary Yellen announced that the CDFI fund was awarding $1.25 billion through the Rapid Response Program to 863 CDFIs across the country. More than 70% of all certified CDFIs submitted applications. Um, the RRP awards will provide CDFIs with an unprecedented level of flexible capital that will allow for growth across the industry. Um, the minority lending program, uh, the $1.75 billion program, will be uh, rolled out later this year. And ESIP, the Emergency Capital Investment Program, uh, will encourage low and moderate income community financial institutions to augment their lending uh, to support small businesses and, and consumers in their communities. Under this program, Treasury will invest up to $9 billion in capital into depository institutions that are CDFIs and MDIs, minority depository institutions. Um, I want to turn to the CDFI uh, budget. Um, the CDFI funds uh, currently offers uh, uh, programs to help CDFIs and other community development entities um, access financial products and services in low-income com communities. And in FY22, uh, the CDFI fund requests $330 million. Um, that is uh, approximately $60 million above the FY21 enacted level, an increase of 22%. Um, it includes uh, primarily uh, increases in the mainline CDFI program, the FA program, um, about, about a 30% increase. Similarly, about a 30% increase in the Native American CDFI assistance program and um, about a $4.6 million increase in uh, administrative dollars. Additionally, uh, we're requesting $500 million in a commitment authority and proposing legislation to uh, uh, expand the capital magnet fund as a part of the American Jobs Plan. So on behalf of everyone at Treasury and, uh, and particularly within the CDFI fund, I'd like to express our gratitude uh, to the committee, uh, to the subcommittee, um, for, uh, for its support and look forward to working with you um, in this coming year. Uh, thank you for your testimony. You probably heard the, the bells going off, uh, so Senator Hyde-Smith is going to go vote um, and then return, and I'll have to go uh, vote after that. But uh, let me now turn it over to Mr. Haskins. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Senator Van Hollen. Um, I just have to take a moment to acknowledge the senator and his commitment to uh, our state of Maryland, in particular Baltimore City, uh, because he's actually made a visit to my institution, and that is somewhat unusual. And to me, I'm uh, deeply gratified and uh, proud to say that you represent uh, our community. Um, also, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, Senator Hyde Smith for her role and participation uh, in this panel and to the other representatives uh, who are present. So I thank you again for the opportunity to be able to present uh, the role of Harbor Bank Shares Capital Corporation, the parent of Harbor Bank of Maryland, uh, before this uh, subcommittee uh, of the Financial Services and General Government Committee. Uh, my name again is Joseph Haskins, and by way of background, again, I'm chairman, CEO, but uh, because of my commitment to the community very early on, and I'm now in my 46th year of banking and financial services, having started at uh, what is now the J.P. Morgan Chase, I returned home to Baltimore to help found a bank. So not only do I chair, but I'm one of the founding members of an institution that is now 39 years old. So by way of history, Harbor Bank was founded with the intent of addressing issues that we saw that reflected an absence of access to capital by the minority community in Baltimore City. So at the end of the late 60s and the early 70s, uh, there were members of the community that said, how can we improve economic opportunities to those who have not had ready access to capital or had ready access to banking and financial services. And as a result of those questions and having identified that shortcoming, the Harbor Bank was founded. I'm proud to say that we opened the doors in 1982 
And I'm proud to say that for the first 16 years of operation, the bank uh, was a profitable organization. It wasn't until the Great Recession that we uh, experienced a real loss. And many of you know that period. But the founding of Harbor Bank was focused in three areas which we saw as vital to providing access to capital, banking services, and economic opportunities. Those three areas we identified involved small business lending, faith-based lending, and residential mortgages. So today we have uh, now grown to a bank of $350 million in size, and as a $350 million bank, we have been able to operate and offer great financial benefits and services to the community. In 1992, we formed a holding company because we found that there were great needs, needs beyond what the bank could contribute. And as such, uh, we formed three additional subsidiaries. And so what I would want this committee to know is that in our community, we have been instrumental in revitalizing communities that were pretty much dormant, distressed, forgotten, and overlooked. The Inner Harbor of Maryland was led in terms of financing by Harbor Bank. The Canton community was led by Harbor Bank with the development of housing, the restoration of old abandoned warehouses, as well as creating retail space for business enterprise. A couple significant projects that we worked on that we saw that brought to the table all of the programs are is East Baltimore's redevelopment of 88 acres. In that case, we were able to bring BEA-related loans. We were able to bring advisory service. We were able to bring law cost funding, and we used new market tracks credits to stimulate the development of a science park, the first two science buildings done in that Johns Hopkins Science Park were done and initiated, resulting from the new market tax credits that provided the incentive for that development. The new market tax credit program, as we see it, is critical in addition to the BEA program, the FA program, the TA program, because when you can bring all of those programs to the table at once, you can revitalize an area. Resulting from our efforts, we have created more than $3 billion of economic development in the Baltimore community, which represents more than 4,000 additional jobs as a success that is now a national model. So with this, I ask the committee to strongly support the request for additional financing and subsidy of the CDFI program. And I thank you, Senator uh, Van Hollen and Senator, Senator Hyde-Smith for allowing me the opportunity to speak uh, to this critical issue and the critical needs in our respective communities. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Haskins. Next, we'll turn to Mr. Anderson. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Anderson. I'm the president and CEO of Bank of Anguilla in Anguilla, Mississippi. I'm also chairman of the Mississippi Bankers Association and a board member for the Community Development Bankers Association. Mississippi is home to the largest concentration of CDFI banks in the country. Thus, the Treasury Department's CDFI fund is extremely important to my bank, the communities we serve, and my entire state. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on this topic today. I thank the members of this subcommittee for their longstanding support of the CDFI fund and providing $270 million last year in recognition of the important role CDFIs play in promoting economic opportunity in underserved communities. As you consider your next appropriation, I strongly urge you to increase overall support for the CDFI program and particularly for the Bank Enterprise Award program. 
Bank of Anguilla has 171 million in total assets and is the only financial institution in two persistent poverty counties that are among the most economically distressed places in the nation. Established in 1904, <clears throat> helping our neighbors and providing a pathway to financial stability is core to the purpose of Bank of Anguilla. Many people do not grasp all the challenges that rural communities like the ones we serve face. Our community and our counties have a combined population of only 5,648 people, of which 33.6 live in poverty. 69% of the population is minority. The median household income is $24,208. There are no traffic lights. There are no major retailers or national chain restaurants in neither county. There's no broadband internet. It's an hour drive to shop at a Walmart or visit a clothing store or department store, which creates challenges for many of our citizens that don't own a vehicle. New home construction is non-existent, and existing housing quality is often poor, as the cost of renovation often exceeds the market value. Many of our neighbors struggle to make a utility payment, put food on the table, or buy school books or clothes for children. CDFI banks, like Bank of Anguilla, help these struggling individuals to meet these challenges. 51% of the bank's current loans are consumer loans made to local residents. We have no minimum loan amount, and roughly 10% of our total current loans have an original balance of $2,500. Like all CDFIs, at least 60% of our lending and activities target LMI communities with solid underwriting practices, civic pride, and mission-driven empathy CDFI banks, like Bank of Anguilla, bridge the gap for financially vulnerable customers. Over the past decade, the CDFI fund has played a critical role in Bank of Anguilla's ability to serve our communities and remain a locally owned institution. Since 2010, Bank of Anguilla has received nine BEA awards, totaling $1.7 million. BEA has the strongest demand among the CDFI programs and is far oversubscribed compared to other programs. In 2020, only $1 in BEA funding was available for every $5.68 in request. Given the benefits generated by the BEA program, it is critical to increase funding. Since 2016, the number of CDFI banks increased by 48%, yet BEA funding increased from only $18.2 million to $25.2 million. Through the financial benefits of the BEA program, Bank of Anguilla is able to make uh, commercial loans to small minority businesses, and consumer loans to individuals that need financial help. Most financial institutions would decline these requests. We recently made two loans with the help of a local agency's Minority Business Enterprise Loan Program to help a minority owner purchase an established restaurant and made another loan to establish a minority-owned physical therapy clinic. We also just financed the opening of a new minority-owned restaurant. We support our local hospital and clinics where approximately 80% of the patients are minority and most of these poor. I could spend hours telling you the small dollar loans we have made, but this would take a whole lot of time here. Demand for all CDFI fund programs far exceeds funding available. I urge the members of the subcommittee to recognize the significant economic benefits of funding the CDFI fund programs. Not only do these programs provide access to credit in historically disadvantaged regions of the country like mine, but they do so by leveraging private investment. I urge this subcommittee to support the CDFI fund program by providing a robust budget for the CDFI fund and include an extremely robust increase for the Bank Enterprise Award program. I thank Chairman Van Hollen, Ranking Member Hyde Smith, and the members of this committee for the opportunity to tell you the story of Bank of Anguilla, the work we do in the communities that we serve. And I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you very much uh, for your testimony, Mr. Anderson, and to all three of uh, you. And I'm a question which really goes to all, all three. I'm going to start miss, with Mr. Poyo uh, about the emergency capital investment uh, program that was part of the December um, legislation and, uh, and legislation after that, providing a $9 billion investment uh, into community development financial institutions and minority depository institutions. Uh, I understand that applications are not due until July 6th, uh, but 
what has the response uh, been to date, and how do you anticipate uh, dealing with uh, the demand? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the Emergency Capital Investment Program has had a great deal of interest, as, uh, as you might imagine, from, from the day uh, that it was uh, passed. And uh, we, have, we opened the application round quickly um, in March and uh, received a, a great deal of feedback from those institutions that, were, uh, that are potentially eligible applicants about how to structure the program in a way that would most uh, effectively achieve uh, the goals laid out by, uh, by the statute and by Congress. And so we have really listened to, uh, to the banks and the credit unions uh, that, are, that are eligible applicants here, as well as engaged in uh, significant uh, in, uh, engagement with regulators um, who are our partners in uh, administering any program uh, in, in uh, carrying out a program th with regulated institutions. And so we are expecting strong demand for the Emergency Capital Investment Program um, in significant part because I believe that we have uh, listened very carefully to the institutions that are eligible for it, um, work closely with regulators, and uh, we will be uh, soon uh, releasing some additional updates uh, that help to address many of the questions that we've seen from the field. But I think listening to the field has really uh, uh, put us in a strong position to see this program uh, be effective. Thank you very much. And we're going to continue with, with questions as Senator Holland had to go vote. Ben Holland had to go vote, and uh, I just ran back. So I will start with my questions, and this is for Mr. Anderson. The Bank of Anguilla is headquartered in the South Delta of Mississippi, one of the poorest regions in the country, and I've received two statements on the impact that your bank has had on the local area that I would like to enter into the hearing record. But what would a funding increase to the BEA program mean for your community there in Anguilla and where your branches are? Sure. Uh, as I said earlier, BEA is very important to Bank of Anguilla, and an increased BEA, BEA award means we could do so much more. We're only a $170 million bank in assets, and we don't have access to capital markets. So grants like this from the fund are really impactful for us. We've received an award each of the last 10 years, which is great, but the amount of the actual dollars we receive is trending downward due to the increased demand in the program. We're grateful to receive the award, but if we could just get the amount bumped up, we could sure do a whole lot more in our community. And BA is important because it's not just a one-time allocation. It's a ward that we have come to depend on and is a tool that helps us mitigate the risk that we inherently have to absorb in serving predominantly LMI customers. Increasing this award could mean that in two of the poorest counties in the nation, borderline profitable small businesses could remain open, potential small new businesses could be started, and the lives of those in, uh, in poverty in our area could be better improved through the work of the Bank of Anguilla. The BEA program is helping to keep small, rural, impoverished communities afloat, and that's a good thing. Good deal. And your opening statement touches on the difficulty many Americans face in just understanding the true meaning of the words rural and poor <clears throat> in our country unless you've experienced regions like in the Delta. Will you elaborate on this and the communities you serve, and how has prior BEA funding benefited them? Sure. One important point to state that Bank of Anguilla, like many community banks and CDFIs across the country, we literally know most of our customers. Our customers are our neighbors, and neighbors help neighbors. They come into our office and they laugh, they cry, they show pictures of their family, and they look for us for guidance and help. Banking is more than looking at a loan application to see if it'll fit into a box. Bankers are missing a blessing if they haven't made a $500 loan to an elderly woman to visit her dying sister, or made a $300 loan to an elderly lady for clothes for a funeral, or made a $400 loan to a man over 100 years old that needed money for his utilities and to put food on his table for Thanksgiving. 
or made a $1,000 loan to a disabled woman to help pay for the funeral expenses of a granddaughter that passed away in a fire. And we might add that Bank of Anguilla employees made up the difference uh, for the expenses of that funeral. We later made a $5,000 loan to this same lady so she could take in two grandchildren. She had to have beds for them so uh, human services wouldn't take them away. All of these loans were made unsecured to people that were poor. BA funds not only help us to make business loans that might not otherwise get made, but it helps Bank of Anguilla and other CDFIs absorb the risk of making small loans to impoverished individuals who need help with the basics of life. Wow, tremendous testimony, tremendous story for real people. And I'm gonna turn it over to Senator Coons. I think he has a question. I recognize you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Um, as someone who has long been interested in and uh, concerned about CDFIs and um, eager to see them play a more significant role, uh, I am so excited by this panel. I enjoyed reading your testimony beforehand. Uh, if I might, um, forgive me, this is not the questions I had hoped to ask. Um, Mr. Haskins, the Harbor Bank of Maryland uh, is a certified CDFI that helps communities in Baltimore. What impact have you seen uh, the COVID-19 relief funding for small businesses and the CDFI fund have on your community? Um, and forgive me, I wanted to ask that question um, of both witnesses from CDFIs. Forgive me, sir. Good. Well, speaking to uh, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, I can tell you that uh, we probably interviewed more than a thousand different um, applicants. We ended up processing 674 applications for a total of roughly $67 million. If we tease out the uh, 30 largest uh, borrowers, our average uh, loan to the borrowers was roughly about $52,000. Uh, we know that we kept businesses' um, inability to operate and survive because we were there. And I don't want to speak to some of my larger brethren, but I can tell you that in our community, uh, it was difficult for many of them to access um, loans, especially when they were of a smaller size. Um, when you looked at loans in the half million or in the multi-million dollar size, we could process those loans in a couple of hours. When we got to the twenty-five and $30,000 loans, we were spending weeks getting those loans processed because you had to walk individuals through the process. Um, when you thought you had clear understanding, you didn't. You ended up uh, actually drawing up many of the documents so that they could apply. The reason I mentioned that we talked to in excess of 1,000 because I engaged all of our uh, eligible staff to work in the processing because we had such requests and the demands were so heavy, there was a third of those that we couldn't get to. The reason I think it's important to know that is because those individuals are still struggling, and I will suggest to you many will not survive because they didn't get the lifeline that the PPP program extended for those businesses that were so impacted by the pandemic itself. And so I would just say to you that it is an extremely important role. And I just want to mention, I know it was raised about the BEA award, and I want you to know that uh, as my colleague Andy pointed out with reference to Mississippi, uh, in Baltimore where we are 160% impoverished beyond what is considered the national average, we find ourselves dealing with many of the same issues in terms of meeting those needs. 20 years ago, we applied and won CDFI certifications. I have been successful in winning 13 uh, BEA awards, which total 
$3,893,000. Those dollars have gone back in to provide some financial support for businesses vital to communities that have not readily received. Unfortunately, in many urban communities, what we know and hear about as food deserts have become bank deserts. Uh -huh. And so they're not easy and readily accessed to financial resources. Harbor Bank has stepped in to help bridge that gap and bring financial resources. And the last comment I will make is that Harbor and in our community, we're more than a bank. We are catalysts for economic development and we're advocates for financial resources. So when you talk about these funding sources, you're talking about funds that we can point to specific projects that are there because of us. We are so knowledgeable of the community that we can go into communities that other financial institutions will not look at and invest our dollars to ignite economic development, and Thank we you. bring in the others. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Haskins. Mr. Anderson, um, my experience in Delaware has been that we have CDFIs that provide access to financial services, much as Mr. Haskins was describing, in both the urban core of Wilmington, Delaware, and in our most rural um, lowest income corners of our state. I was intrigued uh, by reading your testimony about uh, your experience in Anguilla, Mississippi. Um, if you'd just please tell me uh, briefly, if you could as well, about why you support the CDFI fund, why the BEA program is particularly important, um, and how you think we can make the best use of taxpayer money in uh, deploying CDFIs as economic development, access to credit um, um, facilitators across our country from both urban and rural communities? Sure. <clears throat> as I stated earlier, uh, banks like Bank of Anguilla in rural areas have very limited access to capital. We just don't have it. Our capital uh, gro is, grows by local investors and the small amounts we make in profits. If we didn't have the BEA fund, if there, were, if there wasn't a designation such as CDFIs, we would still make the loans that we're making now. We would do it, but at much greater risk. What the BEA program allows us to do is absorb some of these risks and go even further outside the box to help the people in our communities, uh, Sharkey and Esquina counties where we operate, to have just a basic existence in life. So many of us take for granted the daily necessities. There are people across the country that don't have these basic necessities, and they look to us uh, to be able to, to fund these, and they look to us for advice, as Mr. Haskins said. Um, the CDFI program is important to, to banks like us, and it's very important that that dollar amount continues to grow for us because too often banks get an image as the bad guys, but we're there for our customers. Our bank, just like probably most of the CDFIs across the country, we have a heart and a soul. We have a heart and a soul for missions. And that's what we do. Our employees, each one of my employees, I'm so proud of them, they have a heart for missions. They seek ways to help out people. And it all boils down to people, whether it's a business loan or a consumer loan. It all boils down to people, individuals, and family. And I stress a lot on the individual level, the consumer level, but the, uh, the BEA fund and the CDFI program is so important to economic development, too. Well, thank you. Thank you both. I've gotten to know CDFIs throughout my state and have been really struck at the mission orientation, the willingness to invest the time to do the hard work, to get to know your customers, uh, and to do banking, I would say, the good old-fashioned way, meaning it, it's a lot of work, but it provides people opportunity and access. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coons. Um, I have a few questions, but let me defer to Senator Hyde-Smith if you have uh, some. Sorry, as you can see, we're in the middle of voting, so that's why you see everybody. Uh, I, uh, I just have one more. Uh, of course, Mississippi is home to more CDFI banks than any state in the country. And uh, why is that? And, you know, that 
we have more and what benefits do these institutions bring to our state that handle these? Mississippi, as so many people know, and it's well publicized, it's one of the poorest states in the nation. CDFIs are mission driven and are committed to serving economically distressed areas. And we have a lot that fit that description in Mississippi. And we also have many community banks, CDFIs, that are committed to providing economic opportunity for everyone in their communities. So there's a natural alignment between Mississippi community banks that are committed to growing the economy in rural underserved areas and the goals of the CDFI fund. This alignment has benefited our state and provided opportunities for banks like mine to finance projects and to help the underserved. We have a lot of communities around the state that are struggling, particularly in my home of the Mississippi Delta, and combining public dollars with private funds for targeted impact, like the CDFI fund does, is really an important way to combat persistent poverty. There's a lot of work to do, so the fund does a great job of helping all of us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator. And um, to Mr. Haskins and Mr. Anderson, um, I, I was ha had to leave after I'd asked um, Mr. Poyo the question about the new capital uh, funds, uh, the emergency capital fund that was developed. Are either of your two CDFIs uh, applying for those funds? Uh, Senator, yes, we are, and uh, as I reported a little bit earlier, and just to reiterate, um, we are fortunate in that um, not only is the bank CDFI certified, my holding company is CDFI certified, and we have a, a second subsidiary that's CDFI certified with a uh, nonprofit that we have certified, so uh, we intend to apply for the MACs. And one of the examples I can give you, if, if I can real quickly, to say why it can get used for us. Uh, one of the stimulus programs early on from last year, the Main Street program, while some institutions had trouble deploying it, uh, in the last quarter of uh, 2020, we actually deployed $92 million uh, in funds. So... Uh, I say that to say that there is no lack of um, opportunity there. And one other piece that I'll give you, um, if those of you, and, uh, and I always invite people to visit Baltimore and the area north of Johns Hopkins Hospital because uh, many of these hospitals and many of the universities in urban areas are surrounded by low-income and dis highly distressed communities. Well, 88 acres north of Johns Hopkins University was revitalized because we were able to bring tax credits to the table, uh, Harbor Bank direct loans to the table. We were able to bring CDC low income loans to the table and we provided advisory service. Well, there are several other projects that needs funding there. And so uh, we believe that this is a real opportunity for us to make major impact far beyond the communities that I've already identified. And so we will be applying for the full amount, which will be 70 some million uh, in terms of our uh, institution. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. As I stated earlier, we have limited access to capital in the markets we serve. So we'll definitely be applying uh, for capital through the program. In fact, uh, we'll have our application, I hope, finished by Friday. So uh, we're, we're moving forward with that. We think this could be a, a, a game changer in our area. We hope it will be. We believe we could invest in technology to help deploy something like remote deposit capture, which we don't have right now, and other mobile technology that we think will help back banking access across our community. When you look across our community, it seems that everybody has a cell phone. And so I, we believe that this will help. ECIP Capital will also help us to grow our lending areas in some nearby small communities that no longer have local bank branches. Uh, these communities uh, are bank deserts now, and we hope to be able to, to 
lend to the people in those areas. So ultimately, we plan on using the ESIP capital to broaden the service and lending products we're able to offer, and we anticipate that this will continue to help us fight poverty in the Mississippi Delta. Thank you. Um, Mr. Poyo, we've been talking about the uh, sort of additional emergency funds that were provided both in capital as well as in uh, the rapid response uh, program. But, of course, you've got your annual appropriation uh, request, uh, and I, as we said earlier, with the Secretary was here, we appreciate uh, that request. Uh, some have asked, you know, given the fact that we've just provided uh, these large amounts of funds to CDFIs uh, through the earlier legislation, whether there's the capacity uh, to absorb uh, this uh, additional request. Um, what is your response to that based on uh, your current experience and, and your previous experience in this area? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, as, as a former CDFI CEO uh, as well as in my position now, um, it's, it's my experience that the CDFI field is uh, something like parched earth, right? Can soak up a, still a lot of capital, a lot of that water in the metaphor. Um, and what we see is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, which you were talking about earlier, um, there was a lot of question about whether CDFIs would be able to play a really robust role in the uh, uh, deployment of Paycheck Protection Program dollars. And indeed, CDFIs outstripped, I think, uh, anyone's expectations. Um, and so the constraint, the fundamental constraint that I think the CDFI field faces is capital constraint. Um, and so when we talk about capacity, um, it is uh, very difficult to uh, uh, hire staff or, or build your IT systems or all of those things that are, that are good for an institution that's building capacity if, you, if it's not in, in the, the service of actually putting capital on the street and meeting people's needs. And so uh, I, I believe that uh, the capital that we have seen, which is a historic investment and really appreciate that the Congress uh, did this, um, we expect to see that capital absorbed uh, by the field um, and uh, believe that the annual appropriation, uh, that there is an opportunity to grow the annual appropriation to match that increasing capacity that we see in the field. Uh, thank you. And, you know, uh, as you know, that the emergency capital investment program uh, currently only applies to insured depository institutions, bank holding companies, savings and loans, and federally insured credit unions. Um, you and I have discussed this in the past, but we have heard from CDFI loan funds that they would also uh, benefit uh, from the longer-term capital infusions uh, that would be provided uh, under this uh, kind of program. Uh, question one, is there a non-legislative fix uh, to that issue? And uh, question two is, do you believe that the CDFI loan funds uh, would also benefit from a capital infusion? So uh, taking uh, your first question first, uh, um, we have looked very closely at this question. Um, and, and really, I think the, the, the constraint is, is in the statute. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that there is any way, and we've looked at it from a bunch of angles, uh, to, to really construe that uh, loan funds could be eligible as the statute is currently written. Um, that being said, uh, loan funds uh, are, received significant benefit from the rapid response program, which, of course, was just recently announced. And I do believe that loan funds uh, can continue to absorb capital. And so uh, I I'm, I'm really appreciate you th sort of focusing on and thinking through what are ways in which dollars could be uh, crafted to loan funds. Uh, but, of course, we've, we have both put the rapid response program on the street uh, and the minority lending program will be coming uh, later this year, which will uh, create opportunity for, for some loan funds. Thank you. No, and I look forward to working with you uh, on, on that issue. Um, and my final question goes to both Mr. Haskins and, and Mr. Anderson, um, because it's great to have you here um, as really good, important examples of why the CDFI funding is so important to get capital and money into communities. Uh, and uh, two issues have come up. Uh, Mr. Haskins, uh, you mentioned as well the, the new market tax credits um, in one of your earlier responses. And then 
Uh, there was also uh, the discussion of the role CDFIs played in the deployment of the PPP program. I think we all remember in the early days of the rollout of the PPP program, a lot of those funds were working their way through large financial uh, institutions. But at the end of the day, it was the smaller financial institutions and CDFIs that really helped push that money out. So Mr. let's start with you, Mr. Haskins. Can you talk about the role you played in the deployment of the PPP funds, but also some of the other things that you've been able to do with new market tax credits uh, and what important role they play in putting together the pieces for some of these uh, important uh, investments. Great. Uh, thank you again to, for allowing me to speak about the PPP program. What we found is that Harbor, because of our role in the community and a comfort level that uh, many of these businesses have with our institution, there was a greater involvement that we were able to have than some of the other institutions. And uh, as my colleague uh, Andy Anderson has pointed out, we're not just there in the community. We're there with a real serious committed interest to the welfare of those communities. And so uh, we reached out to those that had not reached out to us to make sure that they were aware of the opportunity to proceed. Uh, many uh, kind of automatically believe that when something is announced, they automatically know and understand how to process. But many don't. And, uh, and so we understand that about our community. And so those who had not applied, we were able to get a pl uh, to apply. And we can point specifically to businesses that are vital to the community, the stability of their communities that are there. One sector that often people miss in many urban areas, especially many uh, areas that are older communities, is the role that the churches and faith-based organizations play in those communities. Many of those organizations employ heavily out of their respective communities. And so we were able to get many of the faith-based organizations to apply and thereby keep employment and keep services which were daycare centers, job training centers, um, food uh, preparation centers, et cetera, et cetera. We were able to keep those functional because appropriate dollars were allocated through the PPP program for that purpose. Uh, switching over to new market tax credits because while it's a, not a direct funding program, it is significant because it focuses on low-income distressed communities uh, and it's formulaic in terms of how it's applied. But so many of these communities, both um, urban and rural, have high distress community areas based on the demographics, et cetera. What we have been successful in winning is nine different rounds totaling $384 million, but it's leveraged over $3 billion worth of development. And as a result of doing that, because of the way that the definitional requirements are, employment is a part of it. So one example, and I'll say this and be brief, uh, one of the last science buildings we did in East Baltimore is 1812 Ashland Avenue, through our working relationship, we were able to get Starbucks to put a roaster, the only roast in Maryland, one of the first roasters in the Delmarva area, in a low-income community, and the folks employed in that uh, roaster are from the community. So we created new jobs that weren't identifiable with that community, and so what we know and what we see is that through these programs, we can help leverage greater opportunities for economic revitalization and development. And that's just a simple example of one. Wow, that's a, a, a great example and a, 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 you know, part of the success, I think, of uh, this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Anderson. Sure. Uh, 
our local economy was hurt, of course, by the pandemic, just like everybody else. The few restaurants that we have, their doors were closed for a certain amount of time. And then when they reopened, they were reopened to limited capacity. Uh, churches and faith-based uh, organizations are very significant in our area in, in helping for their needs. Our church offerings were significantly down, and any donations made to these faith-based uh, organizations were down. Between the 2019 flood, we had an extensive flood in 2019 that lasted about eight months. In the pandemic in 2020, our community was really, really hurt. Given the limited number of businesses we have, we were still able to make 218 PPP loans. In an area where there's just over 5,000 people in limited businesses, making these loans helped our county survive, tremendously helped our county survive. If there's a business in our two counties, most likely we, fi we finance that, built that business. I can't think off the top of my head of any business that's existing right now we didn't finance. And businesses in small rural counties have a hard time surviving, but we're there for them. And the PPP program helped our area and they all sought out Bank of Anguilla. And like Mr. Haskins said, our average loan was about $23,000. Most of our applicants had no idea how to fill these forms out or what information was needed. So we spent, literally spent hours on each loan helping our customers out. And so between the PPP loans that we made uh, through the pandemic, that has helped out so much. And with the money that we'll have coming in through the rapid response program and then through hopefully through ESILP, uh, that's going to be a game changer for our communities. Well, let me thank all three of you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, most of all, thank you for what you're doing uh, to help uh, empower our communities and bring more opportunity to more people and small businesses. So with that, this series is adjourned. <laughs>